Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Lampert from the Yale University School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut, and Editor-in-Chief of the Cardiac Rhythm Management Online Community. I have with me here today Dr. Jean Poole, a Professor of Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Poole. Tell us about your, the study that you presented yesterday. Yeah, thank you for um, talking with me this morning, Dr. Lampert. So we presented yesterday the long-term follow-up results of the SCUD-HEF trial. So uh, what did you do? What did you find? Well, let me first remind um, you, as you probably do recall, what the original structure of the SCUD-HEF trial was. I think it's important to think about the results of the long-term trial in view of remembering what the primary trial showed. So the primary trial randomized 2,521 patients in three randomized groups. It was amiodarone, which was double-blinded to placebo, and then to a single-chamber ICD. And the original trial, um, patients were enrolled between 1997 and 2001, and then ended October 31st, 2003. And of course, as you recall, amiodarone was no different than placebo, but the ICD was associated with a very significant reduction in all-cause mortality in patients with moderate heart failure and an injection fraction of 35% or less. So we were really interested in um, asking the question whether or not the benefit of the ICD would extend at least five years after the end of the original trial. So we performed a one-time survey of all of the original 148 participating sites and tried to get mortality data as well as much clinical data as we possibly could. So 148 sites were queried. Two sites, as it turns out, there were no living patients after October 31st, 2001. So out of the 146 sites, we were able to get mortality data on 110 sites. And the remainder of the mortality data we obtained from the National Death Index or the SSDI. So then we also asked these sites to, again, provide us clinical data. And 89 of the sites did provide us some clinical and or arrhythmia data. So at 12 years, with a median follow-up of 11 years for survivors, we looked at all-cause mortality, again, examining the patients who were originally randomized to receive the ICD to those originally randomized into the placebo arm. So this was an intention-to-treat analysis. And we found that the benefit of the ICD extended out to 12 years of follow-up. You know, I think that's not surprising. What, what exactly were, what were the differences that you found? Well, um, there were a couple, I think, really interesting findings that I'm sure a lot of us will need to think about more carefully um, as we go forward. But the overall result, again, was positive with a significant um, p-value and a relative risk reduction of 13%. But the original trial had four pre-specified subgroups. And if you recall, the benefit of SCUD-HEF was predominantly driven by patients who were in New York Heart Association Class II heart failure at the time of enrollment into SCUD-HEF. And that benefit extended out to the 12-year follow-up. A very significant reduction in all-cause mortality, again, was seen in the New York Heart Association Class II patients. And I have found this to be a very interesting finding originally from Scud Heft, and I continue to do so because what I think what it really tells us is that the less ill New York Heart Association Class II patient is really the one that has the most to gain from a simple ICD. Their mode of death is most likely to be sudden death because they haven't evolved yet into progressive heart failure where advanced heart failure therapies begin to dominate what is really going to help that patient population. There was another group that I thought was very interesting also, and that was the patients who had an ischemic etiology of heart failure. In the original trial, the ICD benefited all patients, both with an ischemic etiology as well as a non-ischemic etiology. And in the 12-year follow-up, clearly the patients with an ischemic etiology of heart failure continue to have a significant benefit from having been randomized originally to receive an ICD. So I find that very interesting also. Yes, that is very interesting. Now, since SCUDHEF was published, as you know, it's become standard of care to put ICDs in, in all patients meeting those criteria. How did that impact your ability to do a long-term follow-up study? Well, that's a great question because, again, the study was not a 12-year study. The study ended back in 2003, and this was a single point-in-time survey. So it's going to reflect whatever happened to those patients, whatever their physicians deemed was the appropriate therapy for them. 
So you might have anticipated, had all patients received an ICD at the end of scud heft, that perhaps the curves would have come together. But that's not what we saw. Unfortunately, we had limited clinical data and limited available data regarding who did or did not get an ICD after the end of scud heft. On the patients that we did have data, about 50% or so of these patients received an ICD. I don't know whether that reflects the entire patient population that went into the long-term follow-up. If that's true, however, then only about half of the patients received an ICD, that might be one explanation as to why we continued to see a benefit associated with ICD therapy. You know, the other point is that ultimately, patients with heart failure progress along the course of their disease process, right? So you can imagine that 10 to 12 years out, you're going to start seeing pump failure death or even other cardiac death become the dominant mode of death. So in one sense, if you continue to follow this study out, you might begin to truly see a loss of the value of the ICD as patients become quite ill. But we didn't see that at least during the time frame in which we performed this follow-up study. Now, how do you think these long-term results should impact how we think about primary prevention for this population in general? Well, I think it's a strong support for continued emphasis on providing ICDs to appropriately indicated patients, and particularly, again, in that less ill patient population. And that's a population that I continue to wonder whether or not we really are adequately capturing all of those patients and giving them an opportunity to hear about having an ICD. They're sort of the walking well. A class two patient often isn't the patient that might be followed at a quaternary referral center, for instance, at a transplant center. And so I think we need to really think about how to identify those patients, continue to educate not just electrophysiologists, but the general cardiology physician, as well as internal medicine physicians, to identify those patients, because clearly patients benefit over the long term from an ICD. You know, I think the crossover rate that you described, the 50% or so of patients who had gotten an ICD, is similar to what the utilization rates of appropriate ICDs have been reported. I think it, it can't be more important to, as you say, go out and find these people who could benefit. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, if you look at some of the survey studies that have tried to get a, a handle on what those use rates are, it, it really varies upon where you're at. If you're at, a, again, a large center, I think we do a pretty good job of identifying our patients for appropriate ICD or CRT ICD therapy. But as you move away from the large referral centers and get into the communities, uh, I, th I think that we really are underutilizing ICDs, and again, particularly in this particular patient population. Do you think there are lessons that we could take away from how you at your center do identify these patients to carry that out farther? I think it's a great question too, and it would be wonderful to implement a um, procedure that is similar to what we do for adequate background heart failure medical therapy. When patients leave the hospital, you have to, of course, justify if a patient's not on appropriate medical therapy. And it'd be great to have in place a way to track patients. Think about the patients who aren't seen by electrophysiologists. They've come into a general cardiology service, they've had their acute coronary event. We aren't necessarily involved. So how do you get to those patients to reevaluate their ejection fraction 40 days out or, th or three months out if they've had a PCI or, or coronary bypass graft surgery? So it's getting at following these patients and being able to then appropriately reevaluate them and find out if they're a candidate for an ICD at that point. I agree. That's, that's the next important step. Dr. Poole, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a really interesting view of what's been going on in Scud Heft. Well, thank you so much.